Well, good afternoon. Happy Sabbath. We're going to begin this study this afternoon with a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are so thankful for the study of your word. We are thankful, Lord, for the things that you teach us. And we are thankful for the time that we live in, that we can see uh, the events in this world as they move towards uh, the culmination, as they move towards the end of all things. And we are grateful that we can participate in this, that we can understand the things that are happening around us, and that you've entrusted us with a message uh, to give to the world, and a message that will also transform us. We pray for our church, for this movement, for those that are seeking light. And we just ask, Lord, that as we study together, that you can give us light. Uh, to encourage and strengthen your people. Thank you for hearing our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> well, good afternoon. And um, we're going to be going through uh, Klaus Schwab's book, COVID-19 and the Great Reset. Um, I have here the PDF of it. I also have it in a hardcover. Oops. Sorry about that. It was probably a loud noise there. But I uh, have it there in the hardcover as well, or not hard, soft cover. I have it in print. And it's a pretty depressing book uh, for a number of reasons. One is you can see the direction that the world is going. Now, last night we had looked at the UN. So we had looked at um, uh, the chronology of the start of the UN, uh, but not a lot of details about the UN, which I still would like to get into I'm trying to understand the United Nations better, um, its history. And we also had looked at uh, Revelation chapter 13. And I'm going to bring this up here. So here's Revelation chapter 13. And we had addressed this issue of the mark of the beast and that there is the mark, the name of the beast and the number of his name. And that no man might buy or sell, save that he had the mark of the beast or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Now I'm taking that as three different manifestations of this mark. Um, I know that it could also be understood that it's called the mark, but it's also the name of the beast, and it's also the number of his name, that all three of these things are the same thing. And, and in a sense, they are. But we can see that they manifest themselves differently depending upon the person's a commitment uh, to these things. That is, some people have the mark of the beast, and maybe all of these people have the mark of the beast who are going to be able to buy and sell and we've talked a bit about what that means. But, but some have the name of the beast. Some have the name of the beast, and some also have the number of his name. It is, I don't think that everyone who has the mark of the beast um, is included in, in all three of these. But, you know, I could be wrong, but this is the way that I'm understanding it. And, and we know that the number of his name um, which is a number of a man, the number of the beast, was understood by William Miller as being a period of time. That is, it connected um, pagan Rome with papal Rome. And he was using the, the League in 158 BC and connecting that to um, one, uh, one, five, 508 AD. So 666 years uh, inclusive. Now, <clears throat> we also know that when it comes to the United Nations, we have understood Revelation 17 in this movement. We've understood that uh, these 10 horns, which are 10 kings, represent 
the United Nations. And they have received no kingdom of yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. These have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. That's Revelation 12, or 17, verse 12 and 13. Now, we, we've talked in some of our other studies about the differences between the beast and Revelation 12, 13, and 17. And so I'm not going to go into all of that. But one thing we see is that uh, there's no crowns upon either the horns or the heads in the beast in Revelation 17. But these ten horns, which are represented in each of the beasts, here uh, they become more the focus in the sense that they're going to all be combining with this other head that is the eighth. And this eighth head, um, how we understand this, whether we understand this as um, Joseph Bates did as being the United States when they're in the time of the Sunday law, or whether we understand it in some other way that is what we do see clearly is that these are all united at the end time. These have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. Now, when it comes to understanding the beast, what is the beast? Which beast is it referring to? Because we have the beast of Revelation 12, we have the beast of Revelation 13, which both have seven heads and ten horns. We have the two-horned beast, and we also have uh, the beast of Revelation 17. So when it's talking about the beast, who is it talking about? Rome. Okay. So Rome, what Rome? Technically, it would be Rome papal, but... It's it is still strictly Rome. OK, so so it's papal Rome. And we know that papal Rome is just a different manifestation of pagan Rome. It's clothed in Christian garb, but it's really still paganism. Right. A Seventh Day Adventist, we understand that papal Rome is not truly Christian. It's, it's a new form of paganism. It's dressed up as Christianity, but it still has the same sentiments that we have in paganism. So, um, so the beast here, and, and we have these different beasts. So if we look at the beast here in Revelation 17, um, in verse 3, so he carried me away into the, in the spirit, into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. Who then is the woman? Wouldn't it be the Roman church? Okay, so it'd be the Roman church. So when we're talking about the beast here, um, we can't be talking, when it talks about the beast here later, it can't be talking about the beast of Revelation 17. That is, it would be talking about the beast of Revelation 13, because the beast of Revelation 13 is papal Rome, right? Because this has been one of the issues in understanding these passages. So we have a, a great red dragon, that old serpent, the devil and Satan, right? We have, that's Revelation chapter 12. And we have the first beast, which is the one that is a composite beast. And one of the heads is the papal head, correct? Going back to our studies. Yes, that. agreed. Okay. So in Revelation 17, 
we see a different beast. The woman is riding this beast. Right? So we know that this great whore that's going to be talked about in verse 1, with whom the kings of the earth had committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So we're going to be shown this. And so he shows us this by showing this scarlet-colored beast that's full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns, and a woman is riding this beast. That is, she's committing fornication with this beast, which is the kingdoms of the earth, as you can see as you read through um, chapter 18. It, it's quite clear when it talks about this. So, so when it talks about the beast later in Revelation 17, the beast that was is not, and even he is the eighth and is of the seven and goeth into perdition in Revelation 17 verse 11. This must be referring to the beast, the beast of Revelation 13. Or would somebody make the case that it's referring to the beast of Revelation 17? Well, the question I must ask. Yeah. Is it possible that we're dealing with the woman, the religious power of Rome, mm -hmm. riding upon a beast which is the civil power of Rome. Right. And so the civil power of Rome would be the United States, would it not? Oh, and the kingdoms of this world. Would it not? I'd have to really think about that. Okay. Because it is one of the problems that we, we dealt with, at least we addressed as a question but we never had a really solid answer on that. That is, there are very different views that people have. The pioneers had a different view um, than this movement has regarding these beasts in, in some details, mostly much the same. But when it came to the beast of Revelation 17, um, I think it's hard to say that the beast is both the Roman church and the woman is also the Roman church. You can't, you can't have it both ways. The beast here has to be the civil powers that exist, the governments of this world, and this beast has seven heads and ten horns. So the woman uh, has to be different from the beast itself. Now, we can say that one of the heads is a papal form of government, which is what the pioneers held to. That is, they had uh, that these heads represented forms of government. So they would refer to the state. But here, we're going to have the ten horns that are going to have power. That is, it's not the heads that are going to have power. So... In Revelation 12, let's just go back there. We remember in Revelation 12, the crowns upon the seven heads, right? That's 12 verse 3. Having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. In chapter 13, um, in verse 1, it says, having seven heads and ten horns and upon his horns ten crowns. So the crowns now are upon the horns. But in chapter 17, no crowns are mentioned. But these ten horns are going to have power one hour with the beast. They receive no kingdom as, as yet, it says, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. So they're not being shown with these, these crowns, neither the heads nor the horns. But there's going to come the time when they receive a kingdom that is they receive power as kings for one hour with the beast and these would be the kingdoms of this world so we take this as being the united nations now we had a bunch of questions uh, that we discussed last night um, talking about how the united states gets to the point where it goes contrary to its constitution 
that Republicanism and Protestantism are both repudiated and the Constitution is repudiated. That the United States is no longer Protestant nor Republican when it exercises its speaking as a dragon. That's when it speaks as a dragon and brings about the Sunday law. And we dealt with some of the things like abortion and, and the conflict between uh, the federal and the state legislatures or governments. And I, I don't know if I fully understand everything about the United States government and how it operates, but I do know that the intentions of its founders was that uh, the federal government had very little power and and even the states themselves had quite limited power. The Constitution was meant to limit the power of the state. And, and one of the roles of the federal government was to see that uh, the Constitution was upheld by the various states and that uh, state power didn't overstep the bounds of the Constitution. So there was lots of checks and balances put in place. But it was noted by some of the founders that uh, they didn't believe the republic was very stable because it would require that uh, the members of the republic, the citizens, act in a certain way. That is, because so much power was really given to the individual, uh, if the individual would change uh, their values, then really the state itself could do nothing to stop that change. And, and it would readily take over um, and, and receive power from the people that the Constitution did not allow. So one of the things we saw, saw with the pandemic, and, and we've seen this in other situations as well, 9-11, people will trade freedom for, for safety, even if it's imaginary safety. That is, human beings are going to act not always in their best interest. But the idea that the state is going to act in our best interest is a dangerous illusion. The state has no interest in you. And yet, this is what is often being sold to us, that the government knows what's best for us. And that we have to be, the government has to come in and protect us from ourselves. This is the idea of the nanny state. So I'm pretty sure most of us are familiar with that, these ideas. <clears throat> now what I want to look at then, I, I just wanted to go through those, uh, that foundation there. And, and again, we haven't answered all of these questions completely. But in this book, uh, COVID-19, The Great Reset, um, this is on, on, on the PDF format, it's page 117, but it's actually not the same page in uh, the book. And in the book, it's, um, it's chapter three, I believe. Yeah, it's going to be under this title of, um, let me see if that's really where I wanted to start. Um, I think this is under the environmental, I think this is under the chapter of um, business, but uh, I don't know where this is in this book. So I, I don't know the page, but anyway, if you look at the PDF, which I did send out, you can you can see this. <clears throat> now, he had published this book, The Fourth Industrial Revolution. So we're going to look at this here. I just got to share this. It's under a section called Technological Reset. So the idea is that technology has this role. So... Um, so in his book, The Fourth Industrial Revolution, 
um, he made the case that technology and digitization will revolutionize everything, making the overused and often ill ill-used adage, this time is different, apt. Simply put, major technological innovations are on the brink of fueling momentous change throughout the world. Besides the fact this is really bad English um, in the sense of it's, it's not very clear, uh, what does the word revolutionize mean? Why is he using the word revolutionize? What's the idea behind that? Anybody? Away with the old, and then with the new. Out with the old, in with the new. Yeah. So it, so it's kind of uh, um, this idea of progress, that everything's going to get better. He's attempting also to get an emotional re an emotional response from his readers, yeah. because <clears throat> he wants his readers to think that the current system needs to be overthrown right so so he's he's going to point out this and and this this section here dealing with the technological reset he, he's trying to write in a way that is um is not making pe people too fearful that is he's trying to show that he's considering uh, the dangers of technology as well um and uh, but when he gets into an, the next section, which is dealing with in, individual reset, uh, you can see where his sentiments lie. And you can see it here as well. But so they're dealing with technology. So this is before the pandemic. This is, uh, you know, four years before the pandemic when the fourth industrial revolution was published. And, and what they were looking at is uh, technological progress. Um, and he says, in the four short years since, since, technological progress has moved impressively fast. So one is that we're supposed to be impressed by it, and we're supposed to see technological change as progress. Um, and then he says, AI is now all around us, from drones and voice recognition to virtual assistants and translation software. Our mobile devices have become a permanent and integral part of our personal and professional lives, helping us on many different fronts, anticipating our needs, listening to us and locating us, even when not asked to do so. Automation and robots are reconfiguring the way businesses operate the stagger with staggering speed and returns on scale in, uh, and in speed and returns on scale inconceivable just a few years ago. Innovation in genetics with synthetic biology now on the horizon is also exciting, paving the way for developments in the healthcare that are groundbreaking. So you can see he's using a lot of these worn out sort of expressions, groundbreaking. And when you see this type of language, it really doesn't mean anything, um, but it's meant to sound positive, right? That's, that's the intent of it. Biotechnology still falls short of stopping, let alone preventing a disease out outbreak, but recent innovations have allowed the identification and sequencing of the coronavirus genome much faster than in the past, as well as the elaboration of more effective diagnostics. In addition, the most recent biotechnical techniques using RNA and DNA platforms makes it possible, make it possible to develop vaccines faster than ever. They might also help with the development of new bioengineered treatments. So it sounds pretty wonderful, eh? <sighs> to sum up, the speed and breadth of the fourth industrial revolution have been uh, and continue to be remarkable. This chapter argues that the pandemic will accelerate innovation even more. Um, so that word innovation obviously has a different me meaning than um, for him than it has for me. Anyway, catalyzing technological changes already underway, comparable to the exacerbation effect it had on other underlying global and domestic issues, and turbocharging any digital business or the digital dimension of any business. It will also accentuate one of the greatest societal and individual challenges posed by tech, privacy. We will see how contract Tra contact tracing 
has an unequaled capacity and a quasi-essential place in the armory needed to combat COVID-19, while at the same time being positioned to become an enabler of mass surveillance. Now, um, so what's the problem here? What is it that is not being said in that section? Not being questioned, maybe I should say. I mean, when it comes to the pandemic, should the government have a role in public health? Should the federal government have a role in public health? Yeah, should the federal government or world governments, should it, it, should, should it happen on such a large scale? No. Okay. So, I mean, a government can have some role in public health. But the decisions that are made for public health should be made on first on the level of the individual. That is, governments can inform us about um, information, scientific information, uh, but definitely they should not be compelling us or controlling us or taking away our freedoms. And, and as we can see, this issue of the common good is one of the big problems uh, that we see that is uh, an assumption made by Klaus Schwab and many like him. How do we define what the public good is? How do we define what good is? Those are huge questions. Yeah. And because do we know what's best for other people? No, no. And, and, and we can also take a, the value system. So some people may have the value system that the most important thing is, is that people are alive and healthy, that we should, we should maximize the health of a nation, uh, do everything that we can to protect life. Well, of course, they're not concerning, concerned about lives of the unborn or really about lives of other people in the world or really even concerned about the lives of the people around them. But at least on a sort of statistical basis, uh, somehow the idea that we just are alive is what public health is about. But would you want to live in a society where your health was protected, but you had no freedoms. I wouldn't. I wouldn't either. Right. And, you know, and we, we talked a little bit about this last night, um, the idea of, because uh, you had mentioned it, Dwight, I believe, that some people believe that even he topped it, I can never say the word. Ectopic. Ectopic pregnancies. Uh, should be allowed uh, that you shouldn't uh, abort even in those cases. Now, I don't know a lot about those types of pregnancies, what the survival rate would be, whether it's always a given that the woman is going to die or that the baby is going to die. I don't know. But I tend to be a little bit of a fatalist. That is, I kind of, we live in an age in which man can intervene with technology to save lives, where a hundred years ago, we couldn't. Does that mean our lives are better when we have this technology that can save lives? Is that, is that what makes life better? Is that what our quality of life is based upon? No. How long we live. Or, and, you know, one of the things I looked at some years ago regarding... Um, uh, because we always hear this statistic in 1900 that the average age that people lived was 40 years, something like that. Now, when, when a person became old, once they got through childhood, their chance, their, the average age that they would live is much more than 40. That is, 
people died in childhood. Childhood diseases is what? Once you survive those childhood diseases, uh, you would live actually, on average, a long, healthy life. Now, we've also increased the length of people's lives in the 20th century, but at the expense of morbidity. That is, people, when they had an illness and they were old, they tended to die rather quickly. That is, we didn't have the technology to keep old people alive for years and years and years. And so the amount of morbidity that people experienced before their death was much smaller. That is, people lived healthier, longer than they do presently. That is, people are very healthy, but they can live a lot longer while being unhealthy. So we talk about these um, medical advancements, and I'm not saying that we shouldn't try to care for our health and take advantage of some of these at times, but we have to sort of accept the inevitable that we all die. Now, another thing that has changed, of course, is the fact that people have few children. So when I researched my family tree back in the 1970s, um, I found that there were many, uh, most of my ancestors would have at least 10 children, often more, 14, 18. Um, but they would often go through several wives because often the woman, not often, but occasionally, a woman could die in childbirth. And, and so the man would then marry again and have more children with another wife. Um, all, and how many of those children actually lived to adulthood was was rather small. I mean, it wasn't like less than half, but it was something close to half, um, especially at certain times. So, so we we know that people live longer on average, and that we don't have as much childhood uh, death and we also know that we don't experience death as often, especially, you know, reading some old books. Um, you know, the idea that a baby would die or a mother would die it was a very common experience, especially, you know, if you're having, you know, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18 children, um, you're going to experience one of your siblings dying or more um, when you're young. So it changes our whole way that humanity looks at life, how we value life, um, how we make decisions, what we think about. Um, I mean, one of the things that we see is that people expect to live a long, healthy life. They expect to be prosperous. We are, we are told that our lives are, are better than lives in the past were. And in some ways, we can see we have more luxuries. But are, is, is mankind happier? So there is this, um, uh, you know, this idea that all of these technological advancements have been to our benefit. And they can be useful tools. But when it comes to who man is and what man has always been since God created him, they've actually been, to a large degree, uh, something that has hindered uh, the character of, uh, that God wants man to have. And so we can see when we have a prosperous nation, and we saw this with the Roman Empire as well, uh, it was very prosperous, but it was also uh, very profligate. There was all kinds of sin and corruption. And we see that today, that we have this privileged society uh, that can't decide what a woman is. So when we talk about this uh, progress, we can see that it's not really progress. 
Now, it talks here in this next session section about uh, digital transformation, that is, the technology of uh, what we'd call tech. You know. With the pandemic, the digital transformation that so many analysts have been referring to for years, without being exactly sure what it meant, has found its catalyst. One major effect of confinement will be the expansion and progression of the digital world in a decisive and often permanent manner. This is noticeable, not only in its most mundane and anecdotal aspects, more online conversations, more streaming to entertain, more digital content in general, but also in terms of forcing more profound changes in how companies operate, something that is explored more in depth in the next chapter. Anyway, we're not gonna deal with that too much. Um, so in April 2020, several tech leaders observed how quickly and radically the necessities created by the health crisis had precipitated the adoption of a wide range of technologies. In the space of just one month, it appeared that many companies in terms of tech take up fast forwarded by several years. So an example of this would be my son's guitar store when he still owned it. Um, and he had just gotten his inventory online just before the pandemic hit. We had been working on it for about six months or so, or maybe actually really about, um, yeah, it would have been about six months, a year before he had gotten the website, but he'd really started putting in this inventory. And that's what saved his business. Many guitar stores and music stores went under during the pandemic because they just didn't have enough sales. But his sales uh, increased dramatically because he had the online business. And he had been planning to have about, you know, 10% of his sales online by the end of 2020. But really, it was more than 50% of his sales by the end of 2020 were online sales. And it's continued to be that case. So the changes happen. People are much more comfortable buying things online, even things like guitars, which I would never buy online. Um, but people have had to buy them online and they've just learned to adopt or, 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 or adapt to that. Now, um, so that happened rather quickly and these changes aren't going to be undone, right? We're gonna still be more and more uh, comfortable buying things online. So they're gonna deal with this uh, idea of, um, all the different things that we do now online that we wouldn't have done before, e-learning, e-things, e-commerce, e-gaming, e-books, e-attendance. Um, and of course, we know that in this movement, we've moved to online studies. We don't have a lot of in-person studies. Now, there's an advantage to that. Of course, we can study with people all over the world, which we couldn't have done before. Um, And it's changed also our relationship uh, with those around us. That is, I mean, I attend church less now than I would have had um, the pandemic not happened. So I don't go to church very often. So, so we know that some of these things are going to go back. People obviously are going to have social environments. We're not going to be locked away. Um, which many people were. I, I never really felt that locked away during the pandemic, but some people definitely do. And we're, we're going to see that, you know, some people are still going, there's going to be changes in um, when you get sick, you know, probably you're not going to go to work. Or in, the, in the past, if you were sick, you just went to work. Now you can't. Um, and that's probably going to hang on for a while. Now, um, just seeing there were some things that I underlined here that I want to look at. Um, okay. Oh, yeah. It's another section. Okay, I'm skipping this stuff here. I'm going to zoom out to be faster. <clears throat> okay. I want to deal with this thing of contract tracing. So one of the things that um, I don't know if any of you experienced where you live, 
but in Alberta they have this contract contact tracing um, that is you could get an app and put it on your iPhone and of course this information wasn't going to be stored by the government anywhere it was, I'm not sure how it worked um, but I did have a guitar student who her job was actually to follow up uh, this contact tracing. So if she she would just deal with this online, she would sat in front of a computer, and she would have to notify people that they had been in contact with someone who had had COVID. That's basically was her job. Now, the dangers, of course, of this is you have governments tracing and tracking you. Now, do you think this is something that law enforcement would love to have? I would think so. Yeah, imagine if they could keep track of every person, where they were. Um, if they had a murder or some crime, um, they could tell whether you were there or not. I mean, I mean, we know this kind of brings about this idea of a dystopia. Um, now, the question is, some people say, well, that's fine, because if you're doing something that's, that's illegal, I mean, that would aid the police. But the question is, when do we decide that something is, is actually a crime? Because one thing we could see during the pandemic, and, and we're going to deal with this, um, I don't know if we'll get to this today, but... Um, how how people act or behave um, can be interpreted differently. That is, would a pro is a protester committing a crime? How would you des decide if a a protester is desirable? That is, protest is um, honorable or dishonorable? How how is that decided today? Who decides? Because when we dealt with um, the protests that happened, the BM, BLM riots, um, did the media see look at those riots favorably? Yes. Okay. What about the truckers' protest? No. Okay. Which ones were violent? The BLM. Right. And yet it was portrayed as peaceful, even as you saw things burning behind you. And the truckers was seen as violent, even though it was completely peaceful. Right. Right. So, so if, if the state has that kind of power, and we saw this with the truckers, to actually... Uh, close people's bank accounts based upon donations. Um, you wouldn't want to give that type of power to the state. Even if even if it could be used for good, it can also be used for evil. Now, he's going to look at this contract, contact tracing, um, sort of in a balanced way, at least in, in a way that you, you know, he thinks is quite balanced. He's going to talk about the dangers of what could happen if these were, um, you know, misused. So he says here, the most effective form of tracking or tracing is obviously the one powered by technology. It not only allows backtracking all the contacts with whom the user of a mobile phone has been in touch, but also tracking the user's real-time movements, which in turn affords the possibility to better enforce a lockdown and to warn other mobile users in the proximity of the carrier that they have been exposed to someone infected. Now this to me is one of the most troubling aspects because what are the assumptions underlying this whole this whole paragraph?
that technology is for the public good. Okay. Now, of course, we have this thing that we don't really know what that means, the public good. But is it really needed? That is, cannot people change their behavior if they feel that there's a risk without the use of technology? That is, we also would recognize that if you have technology and people feel that um, they're safe, and, and, and obviously here we're not really dealing with a true pandemic, what we experienced, um, but let's say you were in a pandemic where uh, people were quickly dying of, of some communicable disease, People, people would naturally change their behavior. You don't need the state to come in and tell people what to do. And people, if, if you're having contact tracing, people would probably feel more secure in actually having contact with others, believing that they're safer. But that really wouldn't benefit them. That is, you could probably create greater risk by having this false sense of security. So everything changes the way be we behave. And, and so there's no, there's no way that we can know that this technology is actually better. One of the things we can find is that contract, contact tracing actually was not effective at all. Uh, the research that has been done on this shows that it did nothing to actually help in reducing um, of the spread of, of COVID. So we had something that was potentially uh, uh, a danger, and that is it might have given overconfidence to people. Same thing with mask wearing. Um, people might have a sense that they're safer when in reality they're not. Because masks don't do anything, especially cloth masks. They do nothing to spread, uh, to stop the spread of COVID, uh, which we now know. But they did lots of studies quite early on showing that that was the case. But they still wanted us to wear masks. Um, so when we look at these types of, of situations, what, what we see is that people are not aware of all of the, the effects of a decision that they make. You know, for instance, with COVID, it would probably have been better if um, no actions were taken by the government at all and people were just allowed uh, to make their own choices. The, the virus would have spread more quickly and it would have changed differently than it did. That is, one of the reasons the virus became more contagious was why? Why did the virus become more contagious? What actions, what actions had occurred that caused the virus to become more contagious? Did slowing the spread cause the virus to become more contagious? Yes. How does it do that? Rather than letting it go through its its standard progression, it mm -hmm. it basically wound up having a a greater incubation type period. And and the virus that um, the only ones that could spread, the only forms of the virus that could spread, were the ones that were the most contagious. Right, because it's still going to spread, but it's going to spread. Um, you know, if people had been more exposed to it, it wouldn't have become as contagious. Now, of course, you know, hindsight's 50-50. It's hard to know exactly how things would have been different. But one thing we do know is that the virus has become extremely contagious because people have been social distancing, you know, washing their hands. All these types of things would uh, slow the spread of the the virus, but make the ones that do spread 
the one that's going to be passed on and pass on its genetics as something that's actually more contagious. So everybody is eventually going to get sick. The question is, how fast do you want them to get sick? Now, they wanted this idea that we would just, you know, because the hospitals would be overwhelmed. But the simple solution to that would have been creating uh, special uh, places. And these could have been done because you, you had sporting arenas that were empty, all kinds of things that were empty. Um, and, and you could have easily set up uh, temporary hospitals uh, dealing with people who were in, infected with COVID. So there was no reason that the regular hospital systems should be overwhelmed. And we saw this in the United States, in New York, where the military hospitals were set up, the, the boat, uh, the military vessel to be used as a hospital, and they never even used them. Right. So um, there seemed to be something quite fishy about the whole thing. You know, I'm not saying I, I'm a conspiracy theorist in that sense, but um, it didn't re it wasn't really logical what was being done. It's more had to do with controlling people than anything. The more they could inject fear, mm -hmm. the more they were able to control. Now, yeah. in, in this situation. This coronavirus, mm -hmm. is it as deadly as, say, rabies? No, it's not. Okay. Is it as deadly as, let's say, HIV? No. What about any of the hepatitis viruses? No. No, it's it's actually not a very deadly virus. I mean, it it does, like a cold or the flu, affect people who are suffering from other illnesses, are much more likely um, to die than if they weren't sick. But there isn't a, a strong evidence that healthy people generally were going to die. But in in all of these situations that that I just asked about. Mm. These are some of the most common human viruses. Right. Yet the focus has been on, we must give you an injection for something that is not as deadly as those that were just mentioned. Right. Well, it's, it's, an, um, it's basically taking, it's a misallocation of resources. For one thing, the amount of efforts put in to stop one problem while ignoring other problems isn't really to the benefit of everyone. But it was the popular problem, right? It's the thing that uh, the media played upon. They could have chosen almost anything. You know, I still take the position if it wasn't for the media telling us about this, that most of us wouldn't even have noticed it. That is, if we had not had the ability to know that it was a coronavirus, we might have thought it was a bad flu year. Exactly. Right. Now, and, and we've had flus that are more deadly than COVID and, and affected younger people than COVID did. COVID, for the most part, um, affected those who were elderly and had comorbidities. When you say comorbidity, please explain. Well, they had illnesses that were leading to their death. Fairly Thank soon, you. Right? So right. Means they were going to probably be dying within the next two or three years or four years or five years. So they might have died a couple of years earlier or a year earlier. So they already had an underlying illness. Yeah. So COVID may have contributed, but was not the cause. Right. It's not the cause. Now, I mean, there's there's lots that we, you know, we don't know still. And, and there are problems with the analysis of it because we have had the vaccine and we've had so people have been vaccinated and people have also had COVID. And we, we hear of long COVID. 
uh, the idea that there is these, this aftermath of having COVID, but it's going to be hard to distinguish whether that's the cause of COVID itself or of vaccinations. Because we don't have a control group. We don't have a group of people who uh, weren't vaccinated um, and have not been exposed to COVID, that haven't had COVID. But pretty much almost everybody has had both or one or the other. Uh, people who are vaccinated, most of them are getting COVID because the vaccine, if it's effective, is only effective for a short term and not, not effective against all the strains of COVID. So, or the, or the variants. Okay, so just dealing with some of these things about surveillance, it says the perennial concern expressed by legislators, academics, and trade unionists. Now, I'm not sure why, you know, legislators, academics, and trade unionists are all mentioned in this sentence, but they are. So take note of that. Is that the surveillance tools are likely to remain in place after the crisis and even when a vaccine is fully f finally found, simply because employers don't have any incentive to remove a surveillance system once it's been installed, particularly if one of the indirect benefits of surveillance is to check on employees' productivity. Now, of course, what does what does the, uh, what do you what is the choice that we have if employer employer wants to constantly serve have surveillance of us what what choices what decisions can we make to affect to make that not beneficial for employers can't we just quit our jobs that's possible yeah so so one of the things we see though is that people are willing to give up their freedom for safety, even if they don't believe in it. So it says here, this is what happened after the terrorist attacks of September 11. All around the world, new security measures like employing widespread cameras, requiring electronic ID cards and logging employees or visitors in and out became the norm. At that time, these measures were deemed extreme, but today they are used everywhere and considered normal. An increasing number of analysts, policymakers, and security specialists fear the same will now happen with the tech solutions put into place to contain the pandemic. They foresee a dystopian world ahead of us. So the risk of dystopia. Now, what's a dystopia? Notice it's on page 126. Um, what's a dystopia? Notice it's on page 126. Way to go. <laughs> a dystopian future isn't it that one where the government controls all efforts and all actions of mankind? Well, it can be. There's different types of dystopias. But the idea is it's the opposite of a utopia. So utopia is an ideal uh, world to live in. A dystopia is the opposite of that. A world that's not very ideal um, and you know 1984 would be a dystopia uh, a brave new world would be a dystopia animal farm would be a dystopia uh, there's lots of dystopias that are written about but the idea of surveillance you mean you know, like the big, big brothers watching yeah you mean like the writings of marx and engels are a dystopia yeah, well, they, they don't quite see it that way. They would see it more as a utopia, but but we've seen the we have seen the results mm -hmm. in those governments that chose to follow their writings. Mm -hmm. So so we believe that God created us to be free, and that there is consequences for sin, and that because of sin, man will die that he's given us a means by which to care for our health 
and that much of what the government is doing and in, imposing upon us is actually contrary to the laws of God. And that makes it a dystopia. One is it's not going to really improve the world. People have these ideas of how they can make the world a better place. And that's really what um, uh, 2020 or 2030 is about, the Great Reset, is that we're going to make this world a better place. Um, it says here, dealing with uh, COVID-19 and the power of technology, they th will then be willing to give up a lot of privacy and will agree that in such circumstances, public power can rightfully override individual rights. Then when the crisis is over, some may realize that their country has suddenly been transformed into a place where they no longer wish to live. Um, it's kind of that way in Canada. But, um, I mean, it can definitely get worse than that. But this is what, what has been happening. And, and some, some places in Canada, I mean, they're still wearing masks. They're still restric restricting travel, even though it's completely illogical. Now, why is it that the governments like having this type of power? Because the more that they are able to control, the more they're able to monitor and direct the person or persons in the manner with that they desire. Which would allow them to stay in power. Correct. Right. Yeah. So people who want to be in power, who are in power, want to be in power and want to stay in power. And that's all they're really interested in for the most part. Um, so there's another paragraph here. Surveillance technology is developing at breakneck sp speed, and what seemed science fiction 10 years ago is today old news. As a thought experiment, consider a hypothetical government that demands that every citizen wears a biometric bracelet that monitors body temperature and heart rate 24 hours a day. The resulting data is hoarded and analyzed by government algorithms. The algorithms will know that you are sick even before you know it. And they will also know where you have been and who you have met. The chains of infection could be drastically shortened and even cut altogether. Such a system could arguably stop the epidemic in its tracks within days. Sounds wonderful, right? The downside is, of course, that this would give legitimacy to a terrifying new surveillance system. If you, if you know, for example, that I clicked on a Fox News link rather than a CNN link, that can, te that can teach you something about my political views and perhaps even my personality. But if you can monitor what happens to my body temperature, blood pressure and heart rate as I watch the video clip, you can learn what makes me laugh, what makes me cry, what makes me really, really angry. It is, a cru it is crucial to remember that jo anger, joy, boredom and love are biological phenomena just like a fever and a cough. The same technology that identifies coughs could also identify laughs. If corporations and governments start harvesting our biometric data in mass, they can get to know us far better than we are, know ourselves. And they can then not just predict our feelings, but also manipulate our feelings and sell us anything they want, be it a product or a politician. Biometric monitoring would make Cambridge Analytica's data hacking tactics look like something from the Stone Age. Imagine North Korea in 2030, when every citizen has to wear a biometric bracelet 24 hours a day. If you listen to a speech by the great leader and the bracelet picks up the telltale signs of anger, you are done for. Now, of course, Cambridge Analytica was completely overblown. What they were doing, uh, they were actually misleading people into what kind of uh, power they had. But anyway. Um, So all of this technology is something that we, we can't avoid. I mean, in the sense that technology keeps changing. And, and mankind 
is affected by that technology. So an example, <clears throat> um, in the 12th century, uh, they started to alphabetize knowledge. That is, prior to the 12th century, if you bought an encyclopedia, uh, information was not arranged alphabetically because prior to the 12th century, there were no spaces between words, um, which I find very odd, but that's the case. When language was written down, there were no spaces. And it was always meant to be read out loud. That is, you only read out loud. You did not read silently. But they began uh, putting spaces between words, distinguishing which words were which, and to start to organize information alphabetically. So instead of having lions and tigers and um, cheetahs all together, one after the other in a book, in an encyclopedia, um, you know, lions would be in the L section and tigers in the T section and cheetahs in the C section uh, of, so, of an encyclopedia. So, so it changed the way that man thought about information. Also, uh, they began indexing uh, books. So prior to that, if you wanted to know what was in a book, you had to read it. But once they had indexes, you could look and find information from a book and just read that information itself. And this is, this is to the extreme in the present day. That is, people can find information. They can search through all of the books, the library of information that is the internet, and find information that agrees with them without understanding the context of that information. That is, people don't have to read books. They can read little bits of information here and there and, and have very little understanding of the topic. Now, of course, doesn't mean that that's the natural thing that the internet uh, can do or the only thing that the internet can do because people can find entire books and read entire books online. But the thing is, many people now are not um, able to do that. That is, they've been trained to pick out information because there's so much information. And, and it's changed the way that we look at ourselves. Computers have changed how we look at ourselves, how we look at information. And so technology, the technology of print itself, has changed mankind. So technologies always exist. And they're always going to be changing, but they're not always going to be, make the world better. They're going to make it different. And man will have to adapt to those changes. And some of that adaptation is going to be negative. Now, I don't know if I talked about this before, but um, some people have analyzed the problem that we have in our society today with um, homosexuality, for instance. Now, I can't remember the name of the experiment, but it was where um, they created this ideal environment for rats. They also did it with mice. So that is, uh, oh, what was it called? These rat cities. Um, they ended up with um, a, a change in behavior. So animals like people are not meant to be um, to have no challenges that is we all need challenges in order to grow and develop to be healthy if you provide all of our needs what ends up happening to us if i never have to make any efforts to provide for my basic necessities what what does that change? Our very character. Okay, our character changes. So so we have this idea. Well, to make things better, we're going to make it so that everything's much more accessible. I mean, even think about something like nuts. Um, if you had to go out and gather some nuts and eat them, um, you would probably burn a sufficient number of calories. Uh, 
so that you wouldn't become overweight. But if all you do is eat nuts all day, you know, you go out and buy big jars of cashews and eat cashews, um, you, you have a, a change uh, where cashews are accessible, but you're not going to burn very many calories eating them, correct? I don't know if that's the best example. It's an example. It's, it's an example. Okay. Um, you know, a better example would be, you know, when I, when I was I young. I would have used, I would have used pecans. Um, pecans. Because they're fatter, more fat. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, and I, 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 yeah. And you have to, of course, the same with walnuts. You have to crack the shells and get the walnuts out. But if they're already cracked for you, you're going to eat more, right? Right. I mean, let's, as you look at this, you've got pecan, you've got walnut. You have certain others that that require some effort. Yeah. Yeah, even pistachios, I mean, you have to kind of break them open and eat them. I mean, you could eat a lot of pistachios really quickly. Uh, but if, if they're already open for you, you could eat way more in the same amount of time with less effort. And that's kind of what's happened to our society. Everything is given to us on a silver platter. We actually live in a society of privilege. That is, we have privileges that our grandparents couldn't even have imagined. I thought them kind of nuts was bad for you, though. I don't know if nuts are bad for you. I think no, I'm talking, about the, I'm talking about the um, ones you just mentioned. Pistachios? Yeah, pistachios. I, I thought that was bad for you. I don't think so. You Why would it be bad for you? I mean, if I don't know. That's real. I'm just saying some. That's what somebody was telling me. I don't know if it yeah. was <laughs> pistachios or was it? Um, might have been. It might have been pecan. Not pecans, but um, um, well, peanuts. Peanuts that's in the ground. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, anyway. Yeah. The point here is that, um, you know, when I was young, and, you know, I got married and I had children, um. I had to find work and it was, life was pretty difficult as a young person. I, I came into the job market at a time when we were in a recession, the 1980s. Um, I had to do a lot of things that I was not, um, that weren't very comfortable. I had to go door to door selling artwork. Um, went door to door selling vitamins. I had to do a lot of jobs that were, pretty miserable from for my personality because I'm very shy and introverted. So having to go door to door knocking on doors um, wouldn't be something I'd naturally do. But I learned by doing that uh, to learn how to communicate to people, to get over, to, you know, how to deal with people. And, and of course, I ended up um, doing my music door to door. And that was difficult. Selling my albums door to door was not fun. Every time I went out door to door, I feared going door to door. But I did it because I had to support my family. So if I had had everything given to me, I would never have developed the communication skills that I have today. I wouldn't have started a guitar store and learned to deal with customers and to teach students. All those things that have enabled me to be able to do things like this talking to people. Uh, when I became an Adventist, I couldn't even pray in front of people. I couldn't read in front of people. But because of necessity, I've had to develop and grow. And if you, if you just provide everything for a person, they never have that opportunity uh, to grow. And of course, this is true spiritually as well. If we don't have trials, if everything goes our way, do we need God? When have we turned to God? We've turned to God when we were at our wit's end, when there seemed no place else to turn, no place else to go. And so we live in a world uh, like this rat city where um, 
you end up with all kinds of homosexuality and actually you end up eventually with a type of asexuality. The rats just don't reproduce anymore. They're not interested. And, and we see this happening with our society. Um, and, it, and, it, and part of it is the internet. So one of the things I think, this is my theory, is that when you have a very crowded world, it changes human behavior, sexual behavior, or interactions with others. And the Facebook and the internet has made the world a smaller place. It's in a sense made the world more crowded, even if it's not really more crowded. So, so people have changed their behaviors. And we are definitely heading to a dystopia. We're heading to a time in our world in which uh, people are willing to have the state take care of them. They're willing to have their life easier. You know, what's one of the things that they've been pushing for? And they did this when they gave out this money at the time of the pandemic. You might have heard about it. But it was called, uh, what kind of wage? What is, what is it, or not a, a wage, but um, what is it that they were wanting to do? I can't remember the word. Basically, everybody would get um, enough money to live on. What do they call that? Anybody know what, the, what I'm talking about? Is it some high social security? Well, it's not social security, but the idea is that they would... Everybody would just get enough money to a universal basic income. That's it. Thanks, Iran. So, so you probably heard about this. Now, what's the problem with the universal basic income? Basically, it's an allowance from the government. And somebody else decides what your value is. Okay. So, but you have your basic needs are met, right? But you would have to you'd have to have a tax system to support it, wouldn't you? Yeah, well, that that's a whole other issue, you know, because eventually we're just going to have robots doing all the work anyway. Right. I mean, that's that's the way they look at it. It makes us lazy. You become a slave dependent on your master to feed you when he or she decides to feed you and clothe you and do everything else for you. Yeah, so it makes us dependent upon the government. It makes us lazy. It's like uh, the kid that never leaves home. Um, is that psychologically health healthy for a child who lives at home and never, never leaves mommy and is dependent upon his parents? No, I got out when I was 16. Yeah. But, you know, if you have the state basically acting as this, this parent, um, you're going to end up with psychologically unhealthy people, which is what we already have. We have a whole generation of people that have, haven't the slightest idea of, of what work is and, and think that an employer is just somebody taking advantage of them not somebody who is giving them an opportunity. I had this even with one employee a number of years ago, about 20 years ago, who was a socialist. And, um, you know, even though I was making less money than him per hour, he thought that, you know, I was the, you know, this greedy capitalist. So I, I was making like a dollar an hour and he's making, um, teaching guitar is probably making like uh, $25 an hour. So, you know, so we, we have this idea that, you know, everything should just be given to us. And, and we, in a sense, had that a little bit, I think, when we were younger, you know, when we were teenagers, maybe. But as soon as we hit the real world, the real world wasn't going to just give us a living. But now people want that to be a reality, that the world does owe us a living. And uh, so it becomes a great danger. Um, 
Now I'm going to skip some of this here. Um, it talks, there's a lot of this is just kind of some of the builder, uh, business stuff, stakeholder capitalism, some of the things we talked about a couple of weeks ago, uh, and industry, and these don't really affect us. Uh, okay, I want to deal with this part, behavioral changes. And we're going to deal with this uh, in a couple of weeks when we go through uh, the individual reset and what that's about. But one of the things we know is that people's behaviors can change based upon circumstances and they can be man manipulated. An example I used before um, was there was a park in downtown Edmonton. There was lots of drug dealing and crime and prostitution. Uh, so they started playing classical music at that park. And of course, all the crime disappeared, moved somewhere else. But, um, you know, another example of behavioral change that is often not foreseen, and in economics we call it rent seeking. Um, but I had this guitar student, she was about um, 19 years old, I think. So she was just out of high school, and her mother brought her in for guitar lessons. And um, she was about six months pregnant, I think something like this, or, or maybe she just had a baby. I don't know. I can't remember exactly how that happened. Uh, I think she was pregnant at the time, if I remember correctly. But she had told me that all of her friends were getting pregnant, and they weren't telling, uh, like, they would claim that they didn't know who the father was. Because one is they didn't want the father to be involved in their lives, so they just found some good-looking guy who was willing to sleep with them, and get them pregnant and the reason they did this is because they could get a free education because if you're a single mother in Canada you can you can get your education paid for and of course the government's going to take care of you so why would you have to bother with some guy when the government's going to take care of you and now the reason is they put this to help single single mothers but what it actually does is create single mothers and so one of the things is that often the actions of the state um, distort the market and they cause people to act in ways that really is not to their benefit. So we need to live in a world where life is difficult. We live in a world where life is difficult, but it's becoming less and less, less difficult all the time. And, and naturally we're going to uh, take the, the path of least resistance. That's human nature. So, so they're addressing here behavioral changes. Um, some behavioral changes observed during the lockdowns are unlikely to be entirely reversed in the post-pandemic era, and some may even become permanent. How exactly this will play out remains very uncertain. A few consumption patterns may revert to long-term trend lines, comparable to air, air travel after 9-11, albeit at an altered pace. Others will undoubtedly accelerate, like online services. Some may be postponed, like buying a car, while new permanent patterns of consumption may emerge, like purchases associated with greener mobility. So there's this whole idea of this um, World Economic Forum, uh, where they're trying to sort of control and predict what's going to happen. So they've looked at this pandemic as an opportunity, as they said in, in the first part of this book that we had read, um, uh, that you're never going to let a, uh, so to speak, a crisis go to waste, that they've taken advantage of this to push their agenda. Now, it changes education because people can go online and get education. So why would they be uh, going to a university? Um, but they say here to grasp the extreme complexity and uncertainty of this evolution in consumer behavior, let us revert to the example of the online shopping versus in-person retail. As stated, it is very likely that bricks and mortar stores will lose out severely in favor of online shopping. Consumers may be willing to pay a bit extra to have 
heavy and bulky products like bottles and household goods delivered to them. Supermarket retail space will therefore shrink, coming to resemble convenience stores where shoppers go to buy relatively small quantities of specific food products. But it could also be the case that less money will be spent in restaurants, suggesting that in places where a high percentage of people's food budget traditionally went to restaurants, in New York, 60% in New York City, for example, these funds could be delivered, diverted to benefit urban supermarkets as city dwellers rediscover the pleasure of cooking at home. Uh, the same phenomenon may happen with the entertainment business. The pandemic may increase our anxiety about sitting in an enclosed space with complete strangers, and many people may decide that staying home to watch the latest movie or opera is the wisest option. So obviously people's behaviors change, how, how permanent these are. Um, the one thing that they do know is that they can change people's behavior through fear. And who benefits from these large online shopping? Is, are these big companies or small companies generally? Mostly large the big ones. Yeah, so big companies, right? Global companies. Now, I'm not saying that's necessarily bad or good. I mean, we all like to buy, we, we like to, to pay less for things. We like things to be more efficient. But competition usually helps create more efficiency. The less competition you have, uh, the more that we can be taken advantage of. So whether that's good or bad that people are doing online shopping, I don't know. I mean, for my son, it definitely helped his business. But um, it definitely has changes our world. And it's mostly technology. The pandemic may have sped things up a bit. But, you know, in the long run, it's, it's, um, it's technology that is making these changes. And people, uh, it's, it's allowed governments and large corporations um, connected with the media to basically control people who aren't aware of what's happening. Now, we're going to deal with, um, um, in two weeks, we're going to deal with the, the chapter here having to do with individual reset. And it's probably the scariest part of this book. Um, so I think this is, I'm going to skip all this here. I'll just show you where we're going. So this is where we're going to be in two weeks. So people may want to read over this section of the PDF, which I sent out to everyone. Um, because I think this is where, where the problem really comes um, with how, how this, whole, this whole pandemic has been spun. And, and really what their plans are, what they're, what, what they're trying to do with this pandemic. The other ones are, have to do with technology. And, and those things would be coming anyway. Technological changes always occur. But here, this idea of what uh, the individual reset has to do much more with um, privacy, individual privacy, the choices that we make, um, and, and also the moral choices that are being made and whether we're going to value the individual or the group. And governments, of course, aren't interested in the individual. They can't possibly be. You'd have to know the individual to really be concerned about them. People to them are more like cattle. Now you can have a farmer who has, you know, a small herd and he knows each of his cows personally. And you can have a large industrial farm where the individual cows don't matter. What matters is the overall herd numbers. Um, 
I don't know that you want to be a cow, but which, which cow would you rather be? The cow who knows its master or the cow who is just a number in some large feedlot? I mean, the end's still going to be the same, probably. But you understand what I'm saying? Who's going to be more likely to care for you if you're, if you're sick or injured? So I don't know. I don't know how happy cows can be, but I, I can assure you that there would be some situations where they'd be much less happy and contented. Where well, it'd be like most most small businesses, they care more about the individual than these big corporations. Yeah. That you have. And that's the attraction to small business. I mean, there's a reason why people like the Turner Guitar Studio. Uh, because when you walk in, you're treated uh, with a friendly smile. You're never any pressure being put on you. And, and people are very happy. It's like a family. And um, uh, where if it was just, you know, a large music store, I mean, you never know who you're going to meet when you go in. And usually it's a person who doesn't really care about you, probably is just watching the clock. And, um, you know, it's a completely different environment. So. So this is really where we're going to see some of the scary aspects of um, 2030 and what globalism means uh, to the individual. That is, the individual rights get in the way of globalism. Uh, the one example I want to give, just to kind of close this, to sort of set this up a little bit. Um, in my church in, in Warburg, we had a pastor come in. He wasn't a very good pastor. Uh, we had a good pastor before that, and this pastor came in, and um, he liked to push things through the board. And he wasn't really interested in, and, and, and when I say push things through, the board meetings had to be really short. He had an agenda. Basically, you vote on it, things get done. Of course, pu pushing things through a board, what's the problem? when you push things through a church board? Do things get done? Not always. Yeah, well, they basically nothing happens because unless you have the support of the board members and of the church, uh, the pastor can push something through, but he's not gonna get any support on the ground, right? Agreed. Yeah, so, so one thing I always know is that if, if you're going to be a leader, one thing that you want to do is make sure that everybody knows that they have a voice. And, and the way our church used to work, and, and Lloyd would know about it, is basically you'd have a board meeting, and after the board meeting, the board members would go and talk to the church members about what went on at the board. And if there seemed to be that the decision the board made, that there was some unhappiness with it, uh, the board would meet again and, and bring up some of these complaints. But the idea was that we had a church where people felt a part of the decisions being made. But once you have a church where decisions are made without consideration, because the church is a voluntary organization, people just don't support it. And, and I asked this pastor about it, and he said, well, it's too much trouble to, to talk to everybody. And there's always these people who are naysayers, naysayers, and, you know, I don't want to have to deal with them. You know, it just takes too much time to communicate. Of course, he was foolish because he never really accomplished anything um, in that church, in our church, because nobody ever supported what was going on. Uh, we had another pastor ap after him, same kind of idea. You know, has an evangelistic series, nobody shows up. Well, what's the point? You know, you have to be able as a leader uh, to get people, you know, a good leader who has a goal and a vision can get people uh, to be behind him because he's going to include others and people are going to feel a part of what's happening. But we live in a world now where um, 
everything is go moving away from the local level to the global level. And globalism is not our friend. No matter how much it, it tries to sell itself as more efficient, as more friendly for the environment, etc., etc., in reality, it's more oppressive and more destructive. And, um, and that's one of the things that, that, I, that I see about 2030 is that they have this, this sort of utopia kind of idea of what the world can be, but the direction that they're going is actually destructive. And, and I think that's the actual intent in the end is to really destroy this world, whether the people involved in it are aware of that or not. So hopefully this... Uh, well, they want to destroy the present system and then rebuild their own on it, which is mechanized and totally depersonalized. As long as they're, they're the masters and the few they allow to live are their slaves. Well, it's possible that that's... But, you know, I would say that many people involved in this, going in this direction, um, don't realize where it's going. That is, they might believe the... Um, and some people even believe their own propaganda that the world is going to be a better place. But anyway, hopefully people learn something from the study today. It's, uh, you know, we know that God's in control, that he has foreseen all these things. And, um, and we've, we've known that the world would be going this direction to some degree. It's just a little bit scary sometimes seeing that it's happening now. And what we need, of course, is to know to know God and to know that He He will take care of us. We have to be faithful to Him. We have to develop a Christ like character. We have to know how to minister to others. So I don't want people to get depressed about seeing what direction the world is going. And also not to be fearful because we have nothing to fear for the future except we forget the, the Lord's teaching and the way he has led us in our past history. So let's close with prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are very thankful for the Sabbath. And we know, Lord, that um, you have created us and this world. And that even though it is suffering under sin and will eventually um, perish, we know, Lord, that the purposes here, your purposes, will be fulfilled as we seek you. Help us to pray for those around us. Help us to, to study your word and to understand it and to be obedient. And help us to be an example to others. Help us to warn others about what's happening, as many people do see that the world is going in a terrible direction, but they don't have the answers. Give us wisdom in dealing with souls, that they can have confidence in you. Thank you for hearing our prayer. Amen.